Thank you, sir. Yay, yay me. Yay, raw. Howdy. That's, that's, that's okay, but that, that really wasn't Texas. So howdy. Oh, that, that's better. That's better. Okay, they're going to give me 59 minutes to get y'all through four hours of stuff. So is everybody ready? I will not be taking questions, but if I lose you, raise your hand, because if you don't understand the first part, you won't understand the rest of it. Does that make sense? My email is on your handout. It's tam at tamcummings.com. Please feel free to email me if you have a question. My phone number is 254-216-3668. It's on the website. Call me if you have a question. If you email me, put your phone number in there, because I'm going to call you back. I'm not going to write you an email. Everybody ready? Okay, two people said yes, and we're going to have to go like this. So is everybody ready? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Let's talk about things to do to not have dementia. These are the top five things we know for you to do. Number one thing is dance. Now, I did not tell any of you to go to a dark, smoky bar and dance. I just said <laughs> dance is the number one exercise for you to do as you age. It causes your brain to move large muscle mass and time to music. And ladies, Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did, but she did it going backwards wearing high heels. Dance is your number one thing. Second thing is board games, card games, games that involve numbers and puzzles. So all these yet nights you've spent playing poker, you are actually helping your brain. Good job. Dominoes, bridge, monopoly, games that involve numbers and strategies. Number three is reading is a musical instrument. And if you don't play a musical instrument, you live in San Antonio, Texas, one of the most educated cities in the world. There are 17 colleges and universities here Somebody here will teach you how to play a musical instrument. And no, the kazoo does not count, so don't, don't even try. Number four is books. Or, I'm sorry, number four is puzzles, any kind of puzzles. Crossword puzzles, puzzle books, find a word puzzles, number puzzles. Any kind of puzzle helps your brain. Number five is reading. If you are still reading Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, it is time to kick it up a notch and move on to something else. And now the sixth thing that we know, and the sixth thing is coming on quickly because we are now learning this definitely will help your brain function, is to learn meditation. You started learning some meditation today, but we now know that meditation heals the brain. Meditation helps brain cells function better. Meditation brings your stress levels down. Meditation will help you get through this. If you don't know how to sit and meditate, find a therapist who teaches meditation so that you can learn how to breathe. Even though you're breathing all the time, you've learned today you're doing it wrong. Okay, so find a professional to teach you how to breathe correctly. If you don't feel like you have time for that, get a meditation coloring book. The whole focus of these books is to help you slow down your mind. Now, I've been going to expensive book stores and buying my books. Turns out you can get them at Half Price Books, you can get them at Cracker Barrel, you can get them at any bookstore will sell these coloring books that are specifically designed to help your brain meditate. Everybody with me so far? Yes. I'm very proud of you. Twelve of you answered that time. It's very, very good. Now there are four quick techniques I'm going to give you as family caregivers. These techniques literally will save your life. The first one is four breaths. A lot of caregivers want to do something about stress, and the biggest stress message I hear given to families of dementia caregivers is you guys need to learn to take a day off every week. Why aren't you doing that? How many of you just want a nap? Not asking for the world, you just want to take a little nap. This is four breaths that will realign your autonomic nervous system. Your ANS gets out of balance when you're stressed. That little amygdala messes you up. Your autonomic nervous system runs your upper and lower digestion, your heart rate, your blood pressure. A couple of things that you want to work nice and smooth. You're going to breathe in through your nose to the count of seven. You're going to blow out to your mouth through the count of four. We're going to repeat it four times. I'm going to lead you. I can see you. So if you're not doing it, I'm going to notice that. Everybody ready? Deep breath in. Three, four, five, six, seven, and blow out. Deep breath in. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and blow out. Deep breath in. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and blow out. Last time. Deep breath in. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and blow out. How many of you have trouble sleeping at night? Let's do a breathing exercise for this, and we're going to do the abbreviated form. In 
When you do this trick at home, I want you to take your time and take 10 minutes to do this exercise. Let's start breathing in and out through our nose. Everybody breathing, breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. I want you to scrunch your toes up, scrunch your feet up, tighten your feet up as tight as you can and keep breathing. Breathe in and breathe out. Relax your feet. I want you to tighten your calves and your legs and your thighs up as tight as you can. You should shift up in your chair. Keep breathing in, keep breathing out. Hold all those muscle groups tight. Keep breathing in, keep breathing out. Relax your legs. Tighten your buttocks. You should all sit up a little bit tighter. Tighten up your buttocks. Keep breathing in. Keep breathing out. Hold your butt tight. Hold your butt tight. Think about what you'll be able to say today. Let your butt relax. Tighten up your back. Push your shoulder blades together and flex your arm muscles. Tighten up, tighten up, and keep breathing. Continue to breathe in and out through your nose. Relax your arms, your back. Tighten your face. Scrunch up your face. Make your eyebrows move. Make your forehead move. Scrunch up your face and keep breathing. Keep breathing and now relax. What you've done is you've moved through your muscle groups from your toes to your head and every time you tighten a group of muscles you force the blood to leave those muscle cells and when that happened the muscles tensed and then when you relaxed them and took a deep breath those muscles flooded with oxygenated blood and you relaxed. This technique will help you go to sleep. You wake up in the middle of the night, start breathing, start at the toes and work your way up, you will go back to sleep. Everybody with me so far? Okay. How many of you have had a moment where you cannot make your brain slow down? You've got the doctor coming, you've got your caregiver didn't call in, your person's having a bad day today, and you can't pull yourself back together. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? The next time that happens, I want you to go to the roof freezer, reach in, take out a cube of ice, wrap it in one hand, go to the sink, and breathe. When you are so out of control that your brain can't stop spinning, holding that simple cube of ice will bring your brain back to its bottom line measure of monitoring the sensations of the body. And the ice cube freaks the brain out because your hand is not only freezing cold, your hand is also burning. And in a few seconds, you will simply calm down. That is the Greenstone ice trick. Okay, and that is a wonderful method to get yourself calm back down. And for those of you who are professionals, there are days where everybody in the building seems to be dying. Grab a cube of ice and calm yourselves down. Is everybody with me now? Excellent. Let's move on to cancer and dementia. And let's talk about dementia this way. Cancer is an umbrella term. It means that cells of the body have gone astray and are attacking the body. There are 438 identified cancers. They all have subsets and you know this. If I said breast cancer, you'd say which breast cancer? Bone cancer, which bone cancer? Skin cancer, which skin cancer? Does that make sense? Dementia is an umbrella term. Dementia means that we are talking about one of 108 identified diseases of the brain. For it to be a dementia, the disease must be terminal, meaning all of your loved ones have been given terminal diagnoses. To be a dementia, it must interfere with functioning, and by functioning, we mean the activities of daily living, your ability to transfer, ambulate, toilet, bathe, groom, dress, and eat. It must interfere with memory, and it must be progressive, meaning your loved one doesn't get better. When you say your loved one has Alzheimer's, I say which Alzheimer's? Lewy body, which Lewy body? FTD, which FTD? Vascular dementia, which vascular dementia? Does that make sense to everybody? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. In cancer, the average family is a caregiver two years. In dementia, the average family is a caregiver 10 or more years before care is finally turned over to a community. Which group of caregivers do you think has a higher stress level? The dementia groups. The National Institute of Health estimates that one in 10 dementia family caregivers will die before the person who has the terminal illness as the direct result of the stress of care. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Now, when people have cancer, there's always a miracle. Everybody here knows somebody that was supposed to die five years ago from cancer and didn't. In dementia, there is no miracle. The only possible thing that will look like a miracle is that instead of living to the bed bound stage seven of the disease, your loved one will die in stage five or stage six from heart attack or stroke simply because that's how human beings die. 
So that's not much of a miracle. When the person with cancer dies, the families have very little measurable levels of guilt. And when they're asked why, they say, well, we did everything the doctors told us to do. When the dementia family person dies, their families have huge levels of guilt. And the number one thing that you tell us about why you feel guilty is that you didn't do enough. And I know from where I stand, you've done at least 10 years of care, and I know that you've put your own health at risk as a way to do care. Does that make sense to everybody? That's why there's a test at the end of this hour. <laughs> Everything was fine till I said the word test. The minute I said the word test, nine different sphincters in your body went <laughs> And you begin to think, I'm a grown person. They can't make me take a test. <laughs> then you realize Carol has had her people lock the doors. You will have to take a test. Everybody with me? These are the reasons you need to know which dementia your loved one has. Number one, it is part of your children and grandchildren's medical history. Number two, the type of dementia your loved one has tells you how much time you have left with them. The younger a person is with a dementia, the more aggressive the dementia is. The type of dementia your loved one has tells you whether or not care is available. There are some dementias that it is difficult to find a community that will take a person with that form of dementia. The type of dementia you have determines the progression of the disease, it determines behaviors that we will anticipate and prepare for, and it determines whether or not there is medication available. Is everybody with me? Everybody's with me. You need to take a deep breath in through the nose, deep breath in through the nose. Three, four, five, six, seven, and blow. Y'all are so good at this. Five questions every family needs to know the answer to. Question number one is, which dementia does my loved one have? And so to help you, I've made you a little scale. These nine dementias represent 99% of all the dementias that we know about. If it's not one of these dementias, it's going to be really challenging for us to figure out which one it is. The first dementia is mixed dementia. Originally, mixed dementia was going to mean Alzheimer's and vascular disease, but now we realize that Alzheimer's will join anything, and now we realize that people have two, three, four, or up to five dementias have been found on autopsy. So now mixed dementia means that your loved one has a combination of dementias. The second dementia continues to be the Alzheimer's group. Alzheimer's has four subsets. The first subset is early onset Alzheimer's, EOA. This is 5,000 families in our country are estimated to have early onset Alzheimer's. Every one of these families can trace their origin back to a valley region of Germany. Obviously, there was a genetic mutation that occurred. There is a second form of early onset that is called sporadic. No one in your family has dementia and suddenly your 34-year-old sister is diagnosed. This is not my 90-year-old grandmother had dementia and my mother had dementia and she's in her 80s. This is your 40-year-old grandmother, her brothers and sisters, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, your siblings. This is one of the most confused forms of dementia because the doctor said to you early stage of dementia, meaning how progressed the disease is, by the time you got home it became early onset. You can't be 90 years old and have early onset. It is a specific form of Alzheimer's. The second form of Alzheimer's is Down syndrome Alzheimer's. People with Downs are anticipated to develop this form. The third one is regular onset Alzheimer's. This is people in their 60s and 70s who are showing uh, features of the disease. The fourth form is late onset Alzheimer's. There are multiple variations of regular onset Alzheimer's. There are two variations of late onset. If your person is in their 80s and 90s, the two forms are a progressive form that shows on autopsy significant brain damage, and recently, research has been released that shows that there seems to be a second form where there doesn't appear to be as much structural damage in the brain, but the thought is that the chemistry in the brain is out of balance. Everybody with me? The next group is the vascular group. Now, dementias are named for one of four reasons. Some are named for physicians. So if you find it, you name it. Alzheimer, Lewy, Picks, Parkinson, Huntington, Wernicke, Korsakoff, Crutzfeld, Jakob, Newman, Barr are some of the dementias named for physicians. Some dementias are named for where they are in the brain. FTD dementias are in the frontal temporal lobes, and that's the name of the disease. 
Some dementias are going to tell you in their name what the disease is going to do. Primary progressive aphasia, the primary course of this dementia, it's progressive, it never gets better, is the inability to use and understand language. And the third dementia is a dementia telling you in its name what was its cause. What is the cause of vascular dementia? Some vascular. And there are dozens of variations, which is why you need to know. Your children need to know which form it is because it's part of their medical history. The next dementia is Lewy bodies, which has multiple forms. There's cortical Lewy body, diffuse Lewy body. If the Lewy body shows first and then the person develops Parkinson's, it's Parkinson's Lewy body. If they develop Parkinson's and then Lewy body, it's Parkinson's Lewy body. Does that make sense to everybody? The next group are the frontal temporal dementias. These are divided into three categories, behavioral, communication, or movement. Now, if your person has an FTD, we have a separate FTD staging tool. You just need to see us afterwards, and we'll make sure you get one. If you're a professional, we have FTD staging tools for you so you can have one at your building. Does that make sense to everybody? The next dement, one person said yes. Did you see how I went from everybody needs to be with me to just one person moved me forward? The next one is Parkinson's disease dementia. It is estimated that 80% of the people with Parkinson's disease will have it become Parkinson's disease dementia. Where did the other 20% go? They died before it became the dementia. Next is um, Wernicke-Korsakoff. This is alcohol dementia. This takes concentrated, dedicated drinking. I asked a guy once, I said, do you drink? And he said, oh, one a day. I said, one what a day? A case and a bottle? Dedicated drinking. Next is Huntington's. Huntington's is passed through the family line. The children have a 50% chance of having it. You have a Huntington's support group in San Antonio. The last one that has now been added is chronic traumatic encephalopathy or football dementia. There are two variations. Early form is boys between the ages of 16 and 36. The other one is now men between the ages of 60s and their 80s. There is obviously a third variation coming for men in that middle age group. There are four distinct differences. There is the movement disorder, the communication disorder, the aggression disorder, or the combination all of the above. Is everybody with me so far? So the way you make a medical diagnosis is you take the person's history and their symptoms and you remove everything it cannot be and what you're left with is what it must be. Does that make sense? So, if I was looking at my mother, my mother is 79 years old, she never played football, I can mark off number nine. <laughs> you with me? My mother doesn't have Huntington's, we would know if we had Huntington's in our family. First of all, she would never have made it to 79. Okay, Huntington's kills people much, much sooner than that. My mother never drank, so she doesn't have Wernicke Korsakoff, so I can mark that off my list. My mother doesn't have Parkinson's. We would be able to tell that through testing. My mother is too old to have FTD. We don't have many FTD people in the late 70s. This is a dementia that tends to strike people before the age of 60. My mother's not having hallucinations. She's not delusional. She's not having constipation. She doesn't fall stiff as a board. And she's not accusing anyone of having sex right in front of her, so we can pretty much take Louie bodies off. That leaves me three dementias to go back and talk to the physician about. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. This is all on the test later, so is everybody paying attention? <laughs> Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Use your tool to take out what you know it cannot possibly be and go back and talk to your physician. Everybody with me? Yeah. Okay. Your second question is how is the brain dying? Do you understand the brain in your loved one is dying? The brain is dying either through vascular events or the brain is dying through starvation or the brain is dying due to um, damage in proteins that are causing the brain cells to um, starve to death. Your loved one who begins with a three pound brain, should they live to stage seven, it is estimated they will die with a one pound brain. Is everybody with me? Everything your loved one is doing is directly related back to the area of the brain that is currently being attacked by the disease. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Everybody's with me. The next question is, has your loved one started falling yet? And what does yet mean? It's coming. 
Everybody with dementia falls. This has nothing to do with someone not trying hard enough. This has nothing to do with your loved one's not good, your caregivers are not good. It is directly linked to brain damage. By the end of the disease, your loved one will lose massive amounts of uh, tissue in their, frontal cor in their uh, premotor cortex, their motor cortex, and their limbic system. When these areas are damaged, your loved one cannot stand and walk. But we now know falls so well that the way your person falls actually gives us an indicator of the type of dementia that we're dealing with. If your loved one has Alzheimer's, their most common fall is that they try to stand from their chair. They lose their balance, but they fall backwards into the chair. They land in the chair, so we don't even notice the fall. She's in her chair, she's fine. Oh, she's eating, she's in her chair, she's fine. Oh, she's watching TV, she's in her chair, she's fine. If your loved one's dementia is vascular, they tend to stand at their chair, lose their balance, but they fall forward, landing on their faces, their elbows, and their knees. If your loved one has Lewy body or Parkinson's, they have a very distinctive fall, and their fall is related to some sort of chemical change that's not quite understood, but they stiffen and fall forward like a plank landing on their face. If Parkinson's and Lewy body people are standing still, they will suddenly stiffen and fall backwards, cracking the crown of their head. If the dementias are FTDs, the behavioral or the communication ones, not the movement FTDs. Movement FTDs are people who are very quickly in wheelchairs. But the other two FTDs, by stage five of the disease, are no longer walking straight up the way you and I are. As stage five moves into stage six, they begin to bend and move forward until at the end, they're halfway bent as they move. Am I out of balance when I'm bent like that? Very much. I told you your brain weighs three pounds. What do you think your head weighs? <laughs> 25 to 27 pounds. The bone around your brain is very, very thick. Once the body begins to bend and the head moves forward, the weight of the head now pulls the shoulders into the fall. People with FTD may have up to 30 head strikes a day by the end of the disease process. They do not sit down. They do not keep helmets on. Everybody with me so far? Wernicke Korsakoff may fall in any direction. It depends on how long the person abused alcohol. The two forms of Huntington's are Huntington's disease and Huntington's chorea. Now, this is a tremor. Everybody understands a tremor? This is chorea. Chorea is the limbs jerking. This person may fall in any direction. And in chronic traumatic encephalopathy, we simply don't have enough research yet to understand which will be the most common likely fall for this person. Everybody with dementia falls. You with me? Next question. Has your loved one had a UTI yet? A urinary tract infection? What does yet mean? It's coming. The brain runs the body. As the brain becomes more and more damaged, the body works less and less efficiently. Urinary tract infections are actually a symptom of late-stage dementia. They do not happen because of wet diapers. That is a medical myth. That is simply not true. You cannot develop a UTI from a wet diaper. Your loved one gets UTIs because their brain cannot protect the body from infection. If you and I don't drink anything for the rest of the day, when you go to sleep tonight, you will be dry mouthed, you'll have a headache, You'll be a mean and cranky person, and when you wake up tomorrow, you won't be any nicer. But none of you will have a UTI because all of you have a three-pound brain, and when your brain senses infection, it will raise the body's temperature. It will send white blood cells and T cells to go kill the infection. But none of your loved ones have a three-pound brain. So as the disease progresses and they have less and less brain tissue, the body works less and less efficiently. By the end, it is theorized that the urinary tract infection never really clears the body. So your loved one will be on antibiotics 10 days, cleared two days, and then back on antibiotics. That's the reason why. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, this table up here is the only one answering. So is everybody with me? Okay, next question is, how guilty do you feel? You feel guilty for being here, for learning about what your loved one has? Do you feel guilty for thinking about what will care be like down the road? How many of you have promised someone you would never place them somewhere? A lot of African Americans in here, a lot of Hispanic Americans in here. There's different colors of people. Have you noticed? What color of people gladly take their person to a nursing home? 
you're darn right. My mother makes one mistake and it's off to the nursing home with her. <laughs> you know, I find really bad nursing home cards and I put them in my mother's mailbox and leave them there. I don't sign my name to them. I put my brother's names, one of my sister's names on there. I mean, I don't sign my own name, but I do put them in her mailbox. Who does not put their loved one in communities? Asians, Hispanic, African-American. So a couple of things. When you made a promise to your loved one that you would never place them somewhere, did it ever occur to you that there was even a disease like dementia? Because it didn't occur to anyone else. The medical schools didn't teach anything until 19 the mid-1980s, and the teaching is a paragraph. It's not days and days of study, it's a paragraph. Nurses get a paragraph, CNAs get a little paragraph. So we didn't know. The federal government didn't make a plan because they didn't know, and since the federal government didn't make a plan, the states didn't make a plan, but now here you are faced with someone with a terminal illness that by the end requires 24-hour medical care. So my question to you is simple. When it is time to move your loved one, do you plan to drop them off and drive away or do you plan to come back? Do you plan to come back for education, for family nights, for their birthdays, for holidays? Will your children and grandchildren treat this person with a place of respect in your family? If the answer to that is yes, you need to let the guilt go. Those of you who are the siblings who have stepped up to the plate, God bless you. You are teaching your children what to do for you if something catastrophic happens. Those eight siblings who don't help, they're teaching their children what to do to them if something happens. So God will get them in the end. You don't need to waste any of your energy on it. (laughs) Second note for family caregivers. A lot of times no one steps up to help you because you look like you've got it all under control. So if you don't listen to these ladies and learn to ask for help and form a team, you'll be one of the one in tens. And every professional in here will tell you, we all know the one in 10 person. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, things we can do and things we cannot do. The brain runs the body. As the brain becomes more and more damaged, your person doesn't stand right anymore. Food doesn't process correctly anymore. The infection system does not work right anymore. The brain runs the body. We use empathy. We're not lying. These people have damaged brains. When I was a gerontologist in Washington, D.C., I had a building that had 60 dementia beds on one floor. And for six weeks and three days, at 10.32 every morning, a woman got a phone call in her brain telling her her mother had just died. And we watched her fall down on the floor. We watched her scream. We watched her cry. We watched her grieve. And every night we went home and prayed this would be the last night of that memory. It is empathy we are using, not lies. You and I don't need to be lied to. People with brain damage need empathy so that we are where they are. It is her reality, not your reality. My reality is that the year is 2019 and I'm in San Antonio, Texas, and next week I'm supposed to be in Ohio. That's my reality. But a person with dementia may not be in this year, and that's their reality, and that's where I must go to. Does that make sense to everybody? Everybody's with me? Lady, it's okay. It's okay. (laughs) Things you got to stop doing. You got to stop quizzing your loved one. I can't tell you how angry that makes professionals. You are challenging a person with brain damage to do something they can't do anymore. And you're mad about it. Now think about how we treat people with dementia versus people with any other disease. What is COPD? And what can people with COPD not do well? Would you go up to a person with COPD, get right in their face and scream at them, come on and breathe? You can breathe, I've seen you breathe, you've been breathing all your life, let's see you breathe. (laughs) Why wouldn't we do that? Would it work? Would it help? Would the nurse ask you to leave because you're bothering the patient? (laughs) Have you ever seen somebody with amputated legs? Do you run up to those people and so, get up and run. You are in track, you can run, I know you can run. Get on them little stubby legs and run down that hallway. Run, 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 run. Do we do that to people with amputated legs? Why not? 
kind of cruel, isn't it? It's kind of mean. It's a little ugly. What do we do to people whose brains are dying? Who am I? Tell me who I am. You know who I am. Tell me who I Oh, here's a photo. Oh, she's faking it. She's pretending not to notice me. People with dementia can't pretend and they can't lie. That takes a three-pound brain. They are simply responding with what is still there. Now think about how that feels to be quizzed as to who I am. You ever been to a party? Someone came up and said, hey, you remember me? <laughs> and you didn't? When you didn't remember them, did you do the Texas two-step? Um, how's your, uh, how is, uh, how's work? How's work going? Maybe work will tell me what they did. Do you remember how it made you feel when you didn't know that answer? How do you think it makes your loved one feel when you get right in their face and demand they make their brain work? It is no different than the amputated legs. It is no different than the damaged lungs. Their reality is your reality. The correct approach to your loved one is, Mom, it's me, Tam. I'm your favorite. I'm the good looking one. You always liked me best. I mean, I might as well get in a few points for me while I'm there, right? <laughs> and then, here's a piece of Hershey's chocolate. Hershey kisses are your friend. Do you know why? It's the chocolate of our country. It's the first chocolate most of us ever had, and it is a proven fact. A person with dementia cannot hit you when they have a Hershey kiss in their mouth. <laughs> you give me a bag of kissies, I can bathe any one of your loved ones. And let's touch on bathing really quick. What is the purpose of bathing? Clean skin. It's all we're trying to do. Is there a law that says the only way to clean skin is to dunk you down in bubbly water? <laughs> Today may be the day that you get a washcloth bath. Okay? If that's all you need today, I mean, unless you've got people out hauling rocks and working on the highway, a washcloth bath may be all you need today. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Everybody with me so far? Yes. Okay, great. Now, I have put in your, in your handouts for you what the different areas of the brains are, what are the lobes of the brain, what each of those lobes do during normal function, and what are the behaviors you will see when those lobes become impaired. Everybody with me? But let's talk about what memory is. When the doctor said your loved one's going to lose their memory, did you think that meant they might get forgetful? Or did you realize that meant that they will not be able to use or understand language or sound, that they will not be able to move or turn their body, that they will not be able to control their bladder or bowels, they will not be aware that they have released their bladder or bowels? Did you realize that memory meant your ability to transfer, ambulate, toilet, bathe, groom, dress, and eat? Or did you think memory just meant they'll get forgetful? Memory is everything you and I do. So think about every memory you have as being a file, and think about your brain being the file cabinet. So raise your hands and keep your hands up if you know how to drive. Now, how many of you can drive in the rain? Snow? Lost some of you, didn't I? How many of you can drive in ice? How many of you could drive in ice, but your brain wisely says, ice, bad, don't do that today? <laughs> How many of you can drive three on the tree and four on the floor? Clutch. How many of you can drive a tractor trailer? A tractor. A truck hauling cattle. Riding lawnmower. I just threw the lawnmower in there to make you feel good. I don't really care about that. How many of you learned to drive when you were 15, 16, 17? How many of you learned to drive when you were four? <laughs> Who's going to be harder to get the keys from, me or you? you? Why is it going to be harder to get my keys? I've had them longer. They've been with me always. Think about every memory you have as being a file. Think about your brain as the file cabinet. Your file started in the moment of birth. You met the first person in your life. Who was that person? Mom. She was the only one in the room eager to meet you. The rest of them were just doing their jobs. <laughs> when mom and dad left the hospital, where did they take you? When you got home, who did you meet? Grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, siblings, your dog, your cat. People came to meet you the day you were born. And if you were born male, the day you were born, someone shook your hand. Handshakes are a critical part of our social culture. 
Your parents brought you home and they begin to teach you the same things you have taught your children, the same things their parents taught them. You begin to learn please and thank you, and by the time you were a year and a half old, you were expected to say please and thank you. By the time you were two, you were starting the social conversation of, hi, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. By the age of two, you were beginning to learn how to shake hands. Everybody with me? You started learning your activities of daily living, transfer, ambulate, toilet, bathe, groom, dress, and eat. Bathing is so complex, it takes more than four dozen steps to take a bath. It took you until you were eight, nine, or ten years old to learn how to properly and correctly bathe. And I understand some of you had boys, and at 13 you had to start that whole bath training over again. That's <laughs> just something different. That's not what I deal with. You begin to learn singing. You learned your religious or your spiritual beliefs. You begin to learn cussing. Mom and Dad sent you to school. You went to school to learn three things. What were those three things? Reading, Reading writing, and arithmetic. You learned to play a musical instrument. You learned a bunch of ball games. Do you remember your first love and your first kiss? Y'all still waiting? Okay. <laughs> Well, I wasn't going to stay in San Antonio, but I'll get a room at the hotel and there's a bar there and y'all come with me and we'll put up a sign and maybe we can get some of you a first love and a first kiss. You learned how to drive. You graduated school. Where'd you go next? College? Military? A job? You had to go somewhere, didn't you? Mom said, I don't care where you go, but you're going. <laughs> Do you remember your very first apartment? Would you live there again? Why did mama let you live in such a terrible place? Because she wanted you gone. <laughs> you went out in the world, you found a place you liked, you met someone you liked, you fell in love, you got married, and you had children. Who comes into the family when your children are grown? Grandchildren. It's the ones you actually like. <laughs> How many of you would have started first with the grandchildren? I like those kids better, yeah. Who comes into your life when your grandchildren are grown? The greats come along, and with the greats come retirement, and then in the dementia process, the disease re begins to remove memory in a reverse order of how it was learned. Are you with me? So now I'm going to use my mother to show you what your loved one is doing. My mother was born at home on what is now Fort Hood, Texas. When my mother was six, she got a set of twin sisters. Those are her only siblings. But my mother comes from a large family. She has 63 first cousins, including double cousins. Do you know double cousins? My grandmother and her sister married a man and his brother. Cousins that look an awful lot like the rest of us. You with me? My mother started school walking to a one-room schoolhouse. First, she walked two miles through Copperhead Hill on a cow path. Y'all know cow path? Got this way? Climbed over a barbed wire fence, walked two more miles down a dirt road, got picked up and taken to a one-room schoolhouse. In the afternoon, she got dropped off. She walked four miles back home. Would Child Protective Services want to talk to us if we had a <laughs> six-year-old walking eight miles to and from school? What do you think about that pasture called Copperhead Hill? It wasn't named that because of the butterflies living there. <laughs> when my mother was nine, the federal government closed one-room schoolhouses as we came out of the Great War, and my mother began to get on a bus and go to a school with 15 rooms, one for each of the 12 grades, one for the nurse, one for the kitchen, a cafeteria-library combo. My mother, who could walk eight miles as a six-year-old, played basketball as a point guard, but ladies, as you know, the federal government said we were not strong enough to run up an entire basketball court until 1976. <laughs> so my mother, with her impressive legs from the time she was six years old, could only get halfway and then pass the ball. My mother was the homecoming queen. She was the cheerleader, and the day after she graduated high school, she married my father. By the time my mother was 30, she and my father had five small children, and I am 10. My mother's father lived until he was 63. He died of lung cancer. Her mother lived until she was, uh, until 2003, she died of vascular disease. My mother has five children from those five children, 12 living grandchildren from the first six of those grandchildren, 17 great-grandchildren. Twelve of the great-grandchildren are under the age of six. The others are between the ages of eight and 13. Are you with me? Yes. Now, because of dementia, however, my mother no longer knows that the year is 2019. Because of dementia, my mother thinks that the year is 1970. She thinks that she is 30 years old and she has five small children. Who does my mother think my 80-year-old father is? A grandfather. 
One of the reasons we always want to know your history is if you knew my mother's history, you would know that both grandfathers lived with them before their death. And since she's 30 years old, she sure isn't married to that old man who just refuses to die. That must be a grandfather. Does that make sense to you? I go to my mother. My mother knows that she knows me. I'm in her personal space. I do her lipstick. I comb her hair. I put in her earrings. She knows she knows me. But when she goes to her file, there is no file of me above the age of 10. Who does my mother think I am? Did you skin your knee and run home yelling, sister, sister? She thinks I'm her mother. Daughters become the mothers and the wives. Sons become the fathers and the husbands. Are you with me? If you knew our family history, you would know that at 58, I'm the age my grandmother was when my mother was 30. If you knew our family history, you would know I greatly look like my grandmother. Are you with me? Is my mother calling me her mother to embarrass me? Is this her getting me back for coming in late in high school? She's been waiting 40 years to do this to me. Or is she simply trying to put me in a file that still exists that makes sense to her? Yes. You with me? Yes. Who does my mother think my 50-year-old brother is? Husband. Now, I just told you all this. I told you what. Daughters become the wives and the mothers. Then I throw you a question, and you're like, duh. So she thinks my son is her husband. Is she doing that because of some weird sexual incestuous thing? How many of you know a son who is the spitting image of his father? How many of you know a son with the same name as his father? My mother's got nothing sexual on her mind. She knows she's not married to that old man. This other one here fits the bill better. Does that make sense to you? Who does my mother think her children are? She's looking for five small children. Who does she think they are? The greats? Why the greats? They fit the timeline. What about the extras, the, the, the actual children, the grandchildren? What about those people? Who are they? 63 first cousins is who those people are. Does that make sense to everybody? I, I lost y'all. Does that make sense to everybody? She's simply looking in what is still left in her file cabinet to find places for who we are. Does that make sense to you? I go to my mother and I say, I'm your daughter, and my mother says, I'm sorry, I never married. Where is my mother now in her file cabinet? School. And how do we know she's in school? She got married the day after. Margie went from a cap and gown, slid out of that, right on into a wedding gown, off down the road she went. So if she doesn't remember being married, we must be somewhere in here. Can I ask my mother, what's it like to be married? No, she'll think I'm a crazy person, and your mother taught you to get away from crazy people. All I'm going to do is irritate her. Can I ask my mother, what's it like to be a great-grandmother with 17 grandkids? No, I'm just going to make her paranoid. I've got to be at her reality. Can I ask my mother, what's it like to be a point guard? Yeah, she knows basketball. Can I ask her what it's like to do a cheer for old Evant High? Go Elks. My mother grew up on a ranch. Can I ask her how to milk a cow? How to turn milk to cream to butter? How to make preserves to make bread? How to tromp mohair? By the way, that's the worst job in the world. Don't ever let anybody talk you into that. It's a miserable job. We don't have time to talk about it now. I can have a great conversation with anybody with dementia as long as I respect where they are in their file cabinet. Does that make sense to you? This is not magic, okay? I'm not going to be able to try to sneak up on my mother and go, boo, the year's 2019. That, that doesn't work, okay? Her brain is damaged, and the damage can be seen in CAT scans, x-rays, MRIs. You can see the damage. Does that make sense to everybody? And as the disease progresses, because dementia never stops, your loved one goes to bed tonight with fewer brain cells than they had this morning, eventually, where do all people with dementia want to go? Home. And who are they looking for? Mom and Dad. How many of you got so sick of hearing, I want to go home, I want to go home, I want to go home, you thought, the ranch in Lano, that's where they want to go, and you loaded them up and you took them to Lano, and what did they tell you? It's not home. Home is not a tangible, physical building. Home is emotional memory. I'm going to give you seven things to make a room home. 
Now write all seven of these down because when I start, you're going to think this is crazy. It doesn't make sense, but I'll show you how it makes sense. The first thing that tells you your home is your pillow. What kind of pillow do you sleep on? Is it regular, king-sized body pillow? Is your pillow gel, cotton, foam, feather, or down? Do you like your pillow soft, medium, or firm? The second thing that makes home home is your sheets. Do you like linen sheets, cotton sheets, flannel sheets, satin sheets? Do you like crispy sheets? Do you like soft sheets? What color of sheets do you like? Do you like white sheets, white sheets with roses, Batman on your sheets? Do you like green sheets, plaid sheets, red sheets, blue sheets? The third thing is the weight of the covers on your bed tell you your home. When I'm at home at night, I put my air on 68 degrees. That is the optimal sleeping temperature for a human being, but I'm freezing. So I got two quilts from my grandmother and a down comforter on my bed. My bed covers are this thick. At home, I sleep on a regular sized firm down pillow. I travel every week. I have not found that pillow in a single hotel in the United States. At home, I sleep on colored sheets. I've always slept on colored sheets. My mother didn't own white sheets. Every hotel in this country, guess what color the sheets are? Am I ever comfortable? It's the wrong sheets, it's the wrong pillow. At home, my bed covers are this thick. I stay in nice hotels where the bed covers are this thick. Do I ever feel truly comfortable? No. The fourth thing that makes home home is your art. Now think about the last time you moved. You had the boxes done, you had the kitchen done, the bathrooms were done, the beds were put up, but you didn't say the word home until you hung your art on your wall. When you hung the art on the wall, you backed up and said, oh, that's it, kids. We're home now. This is home. This is our stuff. The next thing is pictures of family. I don't have any pictures of y'all in my house, and some of you I kind of like. But when I get home, I have pictures of 17 little people, 12 people before them my siblings, my parents, my grandparents, and my great-grandparents. Those pictures tell me I'm home. The sixth thing that says home to you is your chair. Everybody in here has a chair. That's your chair. Everybody knows that's your chair. Your kids know not to sit in that chair. And when other kids sit in your chair, your kids get mad at those kids for being in your chair. That's mama's chair. <laughs> because of where I live in Texas, I sometimes get home at 4 in the morning, and I am tired. But I can promise you before I go to bed, I sit in my chair. I want to put my butt print back in there, make sure no one else has been in my chair. I need to be in my chair. My chair says I'm home. And the last thing that makes home home is a smell. But you and I don't know that smell. Well, I don't know that smell, but you know your loved one's favorite perfume or cologne. And all you do is spritz that on a lamp and turn the lamp on, and the room will take on an odor that your loved one loves. And those seven things are what home actually is. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. In your packet, I've given you the uh, different areas of the brain. Learning starts with the hippocampus. Once the hippocampus becomes damaged, this is one of the first times you will notice that something is wrong with your loved one, is because your loved one will have a very distinctive behavior. Peaches, would you tell me I have a doctor's appointment at 3, please? Now you think... I don't look sick because remember, remember, people with dementia do not look sick until the very end of the disease. I asked Peaches a legitimate question. When she answered me, I made eye contact. I shook my head, which means... But a few minutes later, I say, when is my doctor's appointment? Now, did you notice, just a human thing, the first time I said, when is my doctor's appointment, Peaches said, your doctor's appointment's at three, and butterflies flew and doves took off. Did you notice the second time what she said? It's at three. Arr. Human beings give you two shots at information. On the third shot, I say, when is my doctor's appointment? Peaches says, I already told you. And I say, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. So I'm mad and I leave. How many of you have noticed your loved ones are not lazy people? Do you have a hunter and a gatherer? Hunters and gatherers go from room to room to room finding neat new things and they pick it up and they take it to other places where they put it away where no one can find it and they find more neat new stuff. <laughs> Maybe you don't have a hunter and gatherer. Maybe you have Goldilocks. Goldilocks goes from room to room to room trying out beds until she finds one that's just right. She takes a nap. When I wake up from my nap, I come back through the house and I see peaches. <gasps> I'm so excited to see peaches. Do you know why? She knows the answer. When's my doctor's appointment? Now, in here, it's funny, 
but how many thousands of times today have you said the doctor's appointment's at three? This is your medication. Your son was just here. You did go to the party. You have already eaten all of your food. When you begin to see that repetitive questioning, what it should be saying to you is the disease has reached the limbic system and the hippocampus, and that is the reason my person is asking these constant questions. Dementia people do not look sick physically with the disease until the very end of the disease. So think about your loved one as a beautiful new car. Shiny, leather interior, Bose stereo set, all the bells and whistles. But if I simply take away the distributor cap, it doesn't matter what the car looks like, you can't start it and you can't drive it. When you see repetitive questioning, what it is telling you is not, I'm doing this to annoy the daylights out of you. What it says to you is the brain damage has reached the hippocampus. Hippocampus is Greek for seahorse because that little green thing looks like a seahorse. Do you see it? It helps if you turn your head to the side. Okay, that's not true. I just like to see how many people will turn their heads to the side. It really does look like a little seahorse. The disease in different, depending upon the type of dementia your loved one has, will determine where in the brain it starts, but it is when it hits the hippocampus that we are most likely to see what's happening. Two other clues are your person will have trouble doing finances suddenly, or they will get lost when they're traveling, and that's an unusual thing for them. The next part is the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is what makes you, you, and me, me. This is my family, my imagination, judgment, impulse control. Impulse control is what stops you from saying every little mean and ugly thing you have thought today. So if you really want to know, does this outfit make me look fat, go to a dementia community and ask the people there and they will gladly tell you, yes, it does. If you want to know if you have a stylish haircut, go to a dementia community, ask the people. They'll tell you your hair looks awful. If you've got a brand new baby, and I'm warning you, don't do this, it's going to hurt your feelings. <laughs> Take that baby there and they'll tell you, that is an ugly baby. Okay? The disease is in the temporal lobes. The temporal lobes are hearing, language, smell, memory. It's not that these need help. It's that this is dying and cannot translate sound. Your temporal lobe's ability to translate sound is what tells you that's a baby rattle, not a rattlesnake. Does that make sense to everybody? In the occipital lobe, the disease is going to cause a change in visual perception. Your loved one will go from a loss of peripheral vision to periscope vision to binocular vision. And in stage six of the disease, some of you will have your loved one's left eye be turned off by the right occipital lobe, and your loved one is effectively blind in that eye. This has nothing to do with these. These have nothing to do with vision. They simply make a muscle in my eye constrict so you're in focus. This is what tells me what I'm seeing. Everybody with me? Then you have the parietal lobes. The parietal lobes are pain, touch, taste, and temperature. In stage five of the disease, your loved one's body temperature will begin to drop from 98.6 to somewhere between 95 and 97 degrees. You need to know their body temperature. It's the reason they're colder than you and I are. Their body can no longer maintain their body's heat. The disease moves and continues going from what we consider the main part of the brain to the minor lobes. Now, a stage five person doesn't look sick, and they've lost a half a pound of brain tissue. They walk straight. They're lifting their feet. They have good social skills. They're interested in what you and I are doing. They want to know what's going on. Stage six people now have the look of dementia. The stage six person is now bent. They're starting to shuffle instead of lifting their feet. And you notice your person is doing this. What does this make you think? Parkinson's. But it's not Parkinson's. It's a Parkinsonian effect. It looks like Parkinson's, but it's not related to a dopamine change. What that tremor means in stage six is that the disease has reached the cerebellum and the medulla obligata. When your loved one begins to have trouble chewing and swallowing food, it means the disease has reached the brain stem. Everything they're doing is directly related to the area of the brain being attacked. Does that make sense to everybody? Excellent. So vision changes, not because I need new glasses, but because of brain damage. Hearing changes, not because I need hearing aids, but because of brain damage. The ability to taste and smell sweet things remains. That's why you go into communities and you smell sweet things cooking. 
it's not really to sell you a house. You know, that's a trick real estate people use. They cook cookies in your house so it'll smell it. It's to stimulate the appetite of the people with dementia. And then this is called pilling. This is a stage five behavior. It's simply a self-soothing behavior. This is rubbing or touching. This usually freaks out families because they're rubbing. But what if the rubbing becomes rubbing? And what if something gets out? And oh my gosh, what will we do? They're not sexual. They're just rubbing. It's just stimulation on the hand because the hand and feet still get sensation. Um, folding is something that everybody with dementia does. We don't understand it, but if you go to a dementia community and you see residents with a basket of socks or a basket of washcloths, they are not doing the laundry. That's actually an activity. Everybody with me? Okay, because of changes in vision, you must come from the front focused on the right eye, and you must bend and move to get down into your loved one's eye level. Otherwise, all they see are boobs, bellies, and butts. <laughs> That's why some men in dementia communities think they've already died and gone to heaven. They are surrounded by <laughs> boobs, bellies, and butts. Sundowning is the continuation of human behavior, and the cicada rhythm in your loved one's cells throughout their body is now beginning to act independently rather in a cohesive manner. You and I have the blueprint of our bodies in each of our cells. Do you understand that? In each of your cells is also your cicada rhythm, the clock that tells you it's time to go to sleep, it's time to wake up. But in people with dementia, because of brain damage, their clock is now running in all sorts of directions, and that's why they may be up for 36 to 72 hours at a time. Sundowning is simply the continuation of human behavior, because since time began, humans did something during the day, left that place, and went somewhere else for night. That's all they're trying to do. Everybody with me so far? Okay, going through your brain lobes. Everybody with me on the brain lobes? Now I'm on page 11. Quickly, quickly, they're gonna cut me off. Quickly, quickly. They have an actual bet going on as to whether or not I can get through this paperwork in time, so quickly turn to page 11. <laughs> this is the activities of daily living, Dr. Katz's scale, the physical self-maintenance. Texas wants this used for three reasons. Reason number one, you fill this out every time you take your loved one to the physician. This tells a medical professional what your loved one is actually doing at home. Remember, people with dementia don't look physically sick until the very end of the disease. This is how they fool professionals, doctors, family members, members at church or synagogue, neighbors. You fill this out. We're not interested in the score. The doctor is simply interested in can your person do these things? and which stage of it are they now at. So for example, on toileting, you and I can do number one. You may be annoyed with your person with dementia because you're having to remind them. This tool tells you they've got three more stages down before they're at full incontinence. Do you understand how to use the tool? This goes to your physician every time you go. Number two, this tells the community you're looking at where your person really is. And number three, this tells you, the family caregiver, how much more there is in decline before you reach the end of that skill. Does everybody understand? Yes. Your next page is the instrumental activities of daily living, the Lawton Brody scale, the IADLs. Now part of this is common sense. So for example, number E, laundry. My father wouldn't know a washing machine if he fell face forward into it and someone turned it on. <laughs> he thinks clothes magically disappear at night and fairies bring them back the next day clean and folded. You may have a mother who never did the finances because that was your dad's job. So if there is one on here that does not apply, simply exit out, but otherwise this also goes to the physician to show what this person is, is still capable of. Because you are here at a meeting, my estimation is that your person is already in stage five of the disease just because that's when families begin to seek outside assistance and care. Do not be surprised if you have now taken over and are doing all of these things for your loved one. Is everybody with me? Your next page is the geriatric depression scale. This generation doesn't believe in depression. The only place that says the word depression is in the title. So we call it by its initials. This is the GDS. This is an extremely valid test. This has a 98% validity, meaning you cannot fool this test. You are not gonna go home and read this test to your loved one. You're gonna take this test for them knowing what you know. So based on the last two months, I would say, is my loved one basically satisfied with their life, yes or no? Is my loved one, have they stopped many of their activities and interests, yes or no? 
If you circle five bolded answers, five or more is a positive test for depression. And once you have taken the test for your loved one, take a deep breath and take the test for yourself. Five bolded answers is a positive test for depression. And there is medication for depression. It's called antidepressants. Antidepressants will save your life. Everybody with me? This is all on the test later. I just want you to do well. Is everybody with me? Okay. Your next page is the Dementia Behavioral Assessment Tool. This tool is developed based on the behaviors your person will display as the disease moves through the brain. On each stage, we are telling you what that stage is called medically, what is the mental equivalency of this person, how much brain tissue is gone. You and I are stage one. We're not stage one because we think you're going to get dementia. You're stage one because every staging tool must have a baseline of normal. You and I are aging normally. We know who we are, where we are, and why we are. Does that make sense? Stage two is called mild cognitive impairment. Now, as family caregivers, when you look at mild cognitive impairment and you see the first three or four things, one of them says names. How many of you know my name? Okay, it's uh, on your handouts. It's on the screen behind me. I was introduced to you. It's in your book. The reality is your hippocampus looked at me and it said, never going to see her again. Don't need that name. Kick it right on out. When family caregivers read stage through two, your most common thought is, ah, oh, crap, I've got it too. Yeah. So let's take out what is not dementia. How many of you have walked in a room and don't remember what you went in there for? <laughs> that is not dementia. That's normal brain function. That is your brain telling you it doesn't care what you're doing. It's done. It's finished for today. <laughs> How many of you are grandparents? And to call a grandchild's name, you actually have to start at your first grandchild, name every single name, and then you pull that name out. That's not dementia. That is normal brain function. The only thing that is not normal is to have the thought, something is wrong with my memory. Now, I don't mean, oh, Lord, I forgot that. I'm losing my mind. I mean to actually think something is wrong with your memory is not a normal human thought. And if you think that, you need to see a neurologist specializing in dementia. Everybody with me? Stage three is where the word dementia is used for the first time, and dementia is not diagnosed by giving someone a 10-minute exam called the MMSE. The Mini Mental Status Exam was designed as an orientation test. It is not a cognition test. The testing is actually 28 different tests that are done over a period of two to three weeks. These include MRIs, spec scans, EEGs, EKGs, a lot of blood work, and several other things before the diagnosis is made. Does that make sense to everybody? Stage four, now stage three is where if you are a spouse, you notice something's wrong, you tried to point it out to someone and you got your head chopped off and handed back to you on a platter and so you didn't bring that up anymore. Stage four is when your children and friends notice something is wrong. Stage five is when most people are diagnosed and in stage five, your loved one has already lost a half a pound of brain tissue. Stage five, we've divided into an early and later part because there is so much change and damage that occurs in stage five. As a general rule of thumb, I can spot a stage five person because they don't look sick. They do not look physically sick yet, and humans have been taught that if you're sick, you will look sick, and in every disease you do, but not dementia. In dementia, you do not look sick until the brain has lost almost a pound of brain tissue. In stage six of the disease, we call this person in their own little world. They are no longer interested in us. Their entire physical appearance has changed, and for the first time, they now do look like they do have dementia. There is no affect on the face. In stage five of the disease, your loved one accuses you of stealing from them. In stage six of the disease, your loved one is rapidly losing language. Stage seven is the bedbound stage. And in the later stages, I've put in nurses' care plan notes there. As family members, you should be aware in stage six of the disease, your loved one is most likely to break their hip. The hip does not break from falling and impacting the floor. This is a spiral fracture of the hip unique to people with dementia, and it occurs when your loved one stands. The body temperature will begin to change, skin breakdown begins to change, and all of that is in your staging tool. The way you use your staging tool is you start at stage four, check off everything you see your loved one doing. When you finish checking, draw a line and date it. Then go back and look again because I grade harder than you do because I don't have the emotional effect. I am usually a half a stage in front of a family. They can either do it or they can't. When you finish deciding where they are, 
draw a line and date it. Do not come back to this tool for two months. If family caregivers read this tool every day, you will start to see your own behavior in here and it'll drive you crazy. Everybody with me? Everybody understand how to use their tool? Now, Tuesday, November 5th, November 5th at 11 o'clock, I will go over the tool on the podcast with WellMed. So I'll go over the tool in detail on Tuesday. All right, everybody with me? Understand how to use your tool? Okay, your next page is the pain assessment and advanced dementia scale. 50% of the behaviors your loved one displays are behaviors caused by untreated pain because people with dementia are not able to tell us that they hurt. But I know that every single person in here hurts. How many of you are hurting? The rest of you are fibbing. And if you're hurting now, how much more will you hurt in 20 years? We must treat pain. Your last page is your test. This is the caregiver burden scale designed by the National Association of Social Workers as a way to measure the stress levels of family caregivers of people with dementia. Circle the number 40 at the bottom. The bottom of that page are a group of numbers. Circle the number 40. If you give this test to someone or if you take this test and your score is above 40, your own health is now being impacted by the disease. You need to see a physician. If you see a physician and you tell them you're a caregiver for somebody with dementia and they say, gee, that sounds tough, you need to get another physician. Okay? Does everybody understand what we're doing? Yes. Everybody with me? Yes. You got your handouts? Yes. You got my phone number? Yes. You know how to get a hold of me? Yes. God bless you. Good luck to everybody. Take care.